Greetings and welcome to the second part of the immune system tutorial that looks at organizing the ideas or the pieces behind the immune system. The focus of this tutorial would be to look at the second line of defense, the cells, the responses, and the chemicals that are used by the second line of defense to be efficient. So let's begin. So that's my first line of defense. I've got my cells, I've got the responses, and then I also have the chemicals that are going to be present to try to keep us healthy. We're going to do the exact same thing for the second line of defense. So the second line of defense, again, we're going to look at cells. We're going to look at responses. And we're also going to look at the chemicals that allow us to do that particular task. So we're gonna start right off with cells. And when we start off with cells, one of the first ones that I like to discuss are dendritic cells. Dendritic. It sounds quite a lot like the dendrites in a neuron, but you should not confuse a dendritic cell, which is embedded in the epithelium and that and it's down near the connective tissue layer. You should not confuse that with the dendrites of a nerve cell. Dend is from the root meaning tree-like or branching. So the study of trees is dendrology. The tree-like branches off of a nerve are dendrites and the cell embedded in the epithelium that does surveillance to try to protect us and keep us healthy with branching arms is called the dendritic cell. So he's embedded in the tissue looking for things that are gonna try to damage us. There's another cell that's very typical that's found out in tissues, um, embedded in virtually every tissue, and that is the mast cell. The mast cell, its job is to promote inflammation. So anytime that cell gets squashed, pinched, traumatized, or otherwise activated, it's gonna go through something we call degranulation. When it degranulates, it's gonna spit out histamine in massive quantities. That histamine is gonna cause the inflammation response. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself, and yet I'm already gonna start thinking of responses like inflammation. And the chemical being used is histamine. All right, so mast cells are gonna be in every tissue just waiting to release histamine to promote the inflammatory response. Now, beyond that, we have our white blood cells. Now, all of these things are deep. They're between the skin and between the layer of the digestive system. They're in the mesoderm. They're parts of the ectoderm. They're parts of the endoderm as well. And white blood cells are going to be found in circulation. As we go through the white blood cells, I'm going to give you the five main types of white blood cells. And we're going to talk shortly about what each one of those does, what the function is for each of them. The first one I'm going to throw up here is the neutrophil. Neutrophils are phagocytic cells. Their goal is to go out and eat things that don't belong. Now, not only will they eat the things that don't belong, but they will die in the process. So they don't get to eat something, go and find something else to eat, and then eat that as well. Instead, they eat something, they die, and then we need more neutrophils. This is probably one of the reasons that neutrophils account for 60 to 70 percent of the total white blood cells that you have in circulation. So they, by far, are the vast majority of white blood cells that are out there. They're going to be looking for anything foreign, any virus, any bacteria, any fungus, any protozoan, any worm, anything that doesn't promote or have a self-antigen on it, the neutrophils should try to eliminate. Another white blood cell that we're going to talk about is the monocyte. These guys are also phagocytic. Their goal is to go out and eat things and destroy them. Now, in addition to eating things and destroy them, they also can signal other cells to help those other cells learn what a foreign invader looks like and to try to get other foreign invaders or other cells to attack those foreign invaders. When a monocyte is in circulation, they account for 3 to 8% of the total number of white blood cells that we have. Not nearly the number that we see in the neutrophils, because the neutrophils are going to die. So we need lots of them to replace the ones that die. 
the monocytes are going to be longer living. So they are not as, so they don't need as many of them, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, because they live a longer time period. Now, when the monocyte leaves circulation, it's going to go out into the tissues. It grows up, if you will. It becomes a macrophage. And so a monocyte then becomes a macrophage. It does the exact same things as the monocyte does, except it's out in circulation. And we're going to see that the macrophage is really important in helping coordinate the third line of defense. So we want to keep that tucked in the back of our mind. That This macrophage is innate. We're born with it. It goes and eats things, and it gets to live to eat more things. But it's also going to play a role in helping that third line of defense when we start looking at that in some upcoming tutorials. Okay. Other than the monocyte, we have a cell that's called an eosinophil. And the eosinophil is the cell that everybody who has allergies absolutely loves. Because one of the things that the eosinophil does is it eats and chomps and takes extra histamine and sends it away. It destroys it so that the histamine response, the histamine reaction, stops. People with chronic allergies have elevated numbers of eosinophils. The normal eosinophil count should be somewhere between 2 and 4% of your total white blood cells. Now, in addition to this nifty eats histamine response of eosinophils, another thing that an eosinophil does is it attacks parasitic worms. For some odd reason, eosinophils seem to be activated by parasitic worm infections, and their numbers tend to increase. Another white blood cell is the basophil. Basophils are equally important. They have the opposite. It's the, it's the yin to the yin of the eosinophil. So the basophil's job is to release histamine and to help promote inflammatory types of responses. In addition, it's also going to release heparin, which is going to help keep the, the blood thin and allow these white blood cells and red blood cells to move across the body and to get to damaged tissues. So basophils are pretty critical. Interestingly enough, only about a half a percent to one percent of the total white blood cells are basophils. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense when you think, well, we need histamine in order to cause an inflammatory reaction, so why in the world would we only have a half to 1% of basophils? But think about this. We have another cell available to release histamine. It's embedded in tissues, and it's able to degranulate whenever needed, and that cell is the mast cell. So the mast cell is able to release copious amounts of histamine when needed. The basophil only really needs to release histamine if we have a systemic infection in the way of a cardiovascular infection or if there's something that's specifically causing trauma to the cardiovascular system. If we had too many basophils, we probably would have too much heparin. Our blood would probably be too thin, and we will also see an abundance of histamine. So mast cells tend to get the lion's share of the work with histamine release, and the basophils work specifically within the cardiovascular system to assist there. We are up to four white blood cells, and we have one more to go. That last white blood cell is a lymphocyte. Now, Lymphocytes make up 20 to 25 percent of the total white blood cells, sometimes upwards to 30 percent. It depends on your textbook and what ranges they give. This is the second most common type of white blood cell that we have present in the body. These guys are going to be part of the third line of defense. You're born with them, but they have to get trained up. I've always considered these other four white blood cells like the general education, like you go, everybody goes to high school. But the lymphocyte is the special student who gets to go on to college, who gets to further their education, become specialized in some sort of field. Your field might be radiology or nursing or pharmacy tech. The lymphocyte speciality may be chicken pox or measles or that nasty head cold from last year. Now, I'm going to line out three types of lymphocytes. Before I do that, I want to draw your attention to the language. It is not uncommon for white blood cells to be called leukocytes. And one of the five types of leukocytes, leuco means white, 
is the lymphocyte. Lymphocytes are largely found in the lymph vessels, but also in mainstream circulation. It's not uncommon for students to see L and the word site at the end and just let their brain fill in that miscellaneous part with whatever word first pops into their head. Please, please, when you're taking your test, ask yourself, is this asking me about leukocytes or is this asking me about lymphocytes? Because the answer that you give will be very, very different. Now, the three type of lymphocytes that are common are one, the natural killer cell. Another movie analogy, the natural killer cell, I abbreviated as NK, is a cell that is going to go out and use chemicals to try to destroy anything it can that is foreign. It is going to facilitate the process of cyto, uh, Gonna, it's going to facilitate the process of killing the cells, Cyto, cytolysis, there's the word I'm looking for. So it's going to promote cytolysis. These are going, you're going to be born with them, they don't train up to anything special, they're just going after anything that doesn't belong. There are two other types of lymphocytes that become specialized. These are the ones that go to college and become specialized over a specific type of disease. The first one is the T cell, and the second one is the B cell. Note I've written them in blue, so this should be getting your brain thinking, wait a minute, she's saving blue for third line of defense. So even though it's represented as blue here, it is still part of my second line of defense, but these are gonna become important to me when I start talking about the third line of defense. We're gonna sit back and think about that for a while, mull around on that one. Okay, so let's consider our responses and our chemicals. We've already put inflammation up here and inflammation is going to be vital in helping promote healing, helping get the correct chemical environment to draw your white blood cells to the area of damage. And histamine is going to be largely responsible for starting the cascade of events that's going to promote the inflammatory response. In addition to inflammation, and if you remember me talking about neutrophils and monocytes, I talked about the idea of phagocytosis. So one of the responses that we want to generate is phagocytosis so that we can chomp up, eat, and destroy any cells that are foreign that don't belong in the body. And that could include even cells that are part of your body that have become tumorous, cancerous, that we want the immune system to try to recognize and eliminate. Phagocytosis is the process of eating. When we mark a cell for destruction, we do what's called opsonization, O-P-S-O-N-I-Z-A-T-I-O-N. Opsonization is the process of marking something for elimination. Now, I live in the Pacific Northwest and there is a lot of logging that takes place here and I have found that some cases when I go into the forest, I will see that there are trees that have been marked with like a ring around the tree or perhaps an X across a tree. And that's some sort of signal for the logging crew that's going to come in slightly later. That might mean cut down every tree but the one with the X, or in the logging it might mean the X is the disease tree, please remove that. That whole process of one crew going in and marking something is called opsonization. And then the second crew comes in and destroys. So the idea of opsonization is for some cells to mark the cell that needs to be destroyed or the thing that needs to be destroyed. And then for other cells to come in looking for those markings to remove those cells that we need to remove. Now, we're gonna talk about complement in a minute. Um, and one of the things that complement does is it promotes something called immune clearance. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about immune clearance. The just of it is that antigen antibody complexes are attached to a red blood cell, and that red blood cell is sent to the spleen or to the liver and essentially eliminated out of the body. So the idea behind immune clearance is to use the red blood cells, since they're in circulation, to shuttle foreign things around that need to be removed from the body. Another response that you've probably all experienced before is the idea of a fever. And a fever is going to be any elevation in temperature. The idea with the fever is to increase the body temperature sufficient that the microbes that are trying to grow in the body find it really uncomfortable and their enzymes get disrupted by the temperature of the fever and it causes cell death in them. 
the fever anywhere from 99 degrees to about 103 should be sufficient to get us into a range where we can eliminate those microbes, but we start to worry if we hit 103, 104, 105, because fever should be under a negative feedback system. However, if it gets above 105, it becomes positive feedback. It becomes self-reinforcing, and when it reinforces, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. If your brain hits 112 degrees, we're going to have a problem because at 112 degrees, your brain is essentially toast. So fever is very beneficial if it's a low-grade fever, but when we start running high-grade fevers, we want to get into uh, a healthcare professional and we need to start monitoring to make sure we don't cook you as well as the bacteria. Okay, the last thing I need to put up here is the one that I stumbled on a few minutes ago and just couldn't seem to spit out, and that is the process of cytolysis. Anything that does cytolysis is going to be destroying cells, killing cells. And so there are a number of things that kill cells. We're going to look at some chemicals as part of the second line of defense that are going to relate to some of the ideas and the responses that we have here. So I've put histamine on the board, and histamine is huge. You should know histamine. You should own histamine. It should be burned into your flesh in this permanent test tube. I can't forget histamine. In addition to that, many textbooks refer to something called transferrin. And if you think about it, ferrin, ferrin, it sounds like ferrous. Ferrous is iron the, iron. the idea with transferrin is that transferrin binds free iron that is in the blood and shuttles it to the liver or to the bone marrow so that that iron can be used elsewhere. There are a number of pathogens that like or need iron in order to survive. They want to grow in the cardiovascular system so that they can use that iron. And transferrin is a nice molecule that's going to bind up that iron and make sure there isn't a ton of free iron available to hopefully stunt the growth of any microbes that want that iron. I mentioned complements. So complements going up here. Complement is one of 30 proteins. They were named in an incredibly ingenious way by the order they were identified. So we have complement one, complement two, complement three, and so on until we hit 30 because that was the order they were identified. Complement is going to assist the immune system. It is going to cause some phagocytosis. It is going to do some opsonization. It is going to participate in immune clearance, and it's also going to coordinate cytolysis. There will be a separate tutorial to look at complement in more detail, so we're just going to leave it kind of at that right now. Now, complement is going to target bacteria predominantly. It can target other things as well, like viruses and fungus, protozoans, but largely it seems to work pretty well on bacteria. There's another thing that's very like complement that is specific to viruses, and that is interferon. Just like the complement proteins, interferon are proteins that are generated that are targeting viruses, in specific, virons. So I had this epiphany while driving in the car the other day about interferon and how I could actually remember that, and then it dawned on me that interferon's goal is to interfere with viruses. But if you've taken microbiology, you might know that individual viruses are often called virons, interferon. Uh -huh. So they've taken the interfere and the word viron, and they've smooshed them together and created interferon. So another protein that's going to be largely responsible for assisting in attacking viruses. Two more that I want to put up here, okay? If you have fever, you have to have something that promotes fever. And the chemical that promotes fever is pyrogen. Now, if you're looking at words and root words, that should hopefully trigger to you, oh, I've heard of pyromaniacs. I've heard pyro before. Pyro means fire. So it makes sense to us that pyrogens are chemicals that promote fever. They can be endogenous or exogenous, meaning either the body can make them or there are certain microbes out there that will release pyrogens and cause inflammation, sorry, and cause fever all on their own accord. Cytolysis oftentimes takes place by the release of toxins that are called cytotoxins.
So for now, we're going to leave it as a broad category of cytotoxins. When we start talking about the third line of defense, I'm going to toss out a couple of names of cytotoxins that are commonly used by the T cells. Okay. Now, natural killer cells are going to assist and promote cytolysis by using cytotoxins to elicit or to uh, be able to meet their end goal. 